Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is going down the AAS education series. And I am super happy to have Kate Meredith of Geneva Lake Astrophysics and STEAM with us today. Hey, Kate. Hey, nice to be here. So nice of you to talk about your education activities. That's very awesome. Uh, well, I, I, like I said, it's hard to get me to stop once you get me started. <laughs> Uh, you have a very interesting background there. It looks like you have all kinds of toys and stuff. Yes, I can't wait to give you the tour. Ooh, we are going to get some toys today on educational stuff. This is totally awesome. Uh, and Kate, so uh, Geneva Lake and Lake Geneva um, is somewhere in the Midwest. So where are you located? We're just about a two-hour drive north of Chicago, uh, kind mm -hmm. of situated on a triangle between Milwaukee and Madison, and we're on Geneva Lake. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, summer in full bloom, or are we starting to do a little change in the fall? It's doing the August dry out, but you know, I'm sure that we'll get 90 degree temperatures as soon as students go back to school in a couple of weeks. Naturally. Naturally. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. How, are, how are things down uh, your way? Uh, so I'm in Phoenix, Arizona on this August 25th of 2022 as we shoot this and summer is in full swing uh, in Phoenix and we're actually getting a pretty wet summer. Uh, this yeah. uh, two years ago was extremely dry. Um, but this year is particularly wet. Um, so I have grape vines. My grape vines are loving it. Um, so they're doing super well. Uh, but yeah, overall, um, doing great in, in Phoenix in the desert heat. So we do get a lot of Wisconsinites coming in the winter. So we get yes. the birds coming down in, into Phoenix um, during that time. So very cool. Uh, let's see, Kate, uh, what do you like to do in education? Well, I like to do a lot of things. So we um, we started off as um, an office of Yerkes Education Outreach. So I'm the former Education Outreach Coordinator from um, Yerkes Observatory. And yeah. when that closed in 2018, we moved off site. And we have persisted off site um, since then. It's almost four years now. And we originally were just a holding pattern for a possible return to the building. But now we exist independently forever. And our mission has gotten pretty uh, specific and pretty well pretty big, but um, it's all about getting the most diverse community involved with astronomy and astronomy related fields that we possibly can and making that accessible, interesting and uh, and helping people network and get into that network and um, community involvement. So we do everything from dark skies work. Uh, we do um, tech projects with high school students. Cool. We are part of the, we're one of the founding members of the um, uh, IAU's um, Regional Office of Astronomy for Development. So we try and use the resources of astronomy for economic and social development, both in the West, Midwest and through the North American region. That's a pretty young office. So we're getting our feet on the ground with that, looking at a lot of astrotourism things and, and which is related to our dark skies work. But the favorite thing that I do is in the area of accessibility. So as a former okay. high school teacher, Okay. Um, I have a real soft spot for those students who have said you know, their science isn't for me. I'm not good at science. I'm kind of an artsy person. I don't, you know, I don't do this. Or, or the students who come into my class and and they're, um, you know, they're taking part in special ed programs. I want to make this a really cool experience for everybody. And yeah. I was strictly one of those uh, environmental science biology teachers, but I had an opportunity many years ago to teach um, an elective in astronomy and hustled to learn because cool. uh, you, when you're a teacher when somebody says would you like to teach an elective you do not say no <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, and when I found out what a motivator it was for all of my students and made uh, math really sensible um, yeah. I really got into it and I stayed into it for all those years that I was raising kids and only wor working part time outside the home. Um, astronomy gave me something really cool to talk about at parties. Um, I raise kids. I raise my children. And when you get the blank look, you say, but I do quasar research. <laughs> and you got them. So what? and one thing yeah. led to one thing led to another, and I just do um, with a whole group of people here at Glass. So it's me today because 
all the interns have gone home and everyone's kind of taken a vacation. So we've got about 3000 square feet of open space over there. Nice. And um, it's kind of noisy here usually. And there's lots of people doing things, but it's, um, we do all those projects that uh, areas I described, but what I'm gonna really talk about today is making cool things to make astronomy really accessible to everybody. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly appreciate uh, the uh, the outreach to the science phobia, shall we say, or uh -huh. phobia students or the art students. Um, you know, I spent several years uh, in Chicago uh, teaching at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago uh, because they do get a real a real degree, uh, and part of that is taking a science, and astronomy was a, a popular choice. Uh, mm -hmm. So it gave me several years to to uh, engage learners who are more art orientated um, than that. And uh, that was both a very scary thing and both a very rewarding thing, I have to say. Um, so it was very cool. And those lessons that I learned at that point uh, are still with me today. Um, so most of the courses that I teach at Arizona State University are uh, large introductory courses. Uh, mm -hmm. They are geared for people who um, have waited until the very last semester to take the dreaded science course. Oh, no. <laughs> um, um, so I, I appreciate that that outreach beyond just, you know, the hardcore science types who are going to do science regardless. So, so what do you feel like was your big takeaway from, you know, Art Institute and to doing astronomy uh, with the masses? Mm -hmm. Speak in plain English. Uh, yeah. So what, what... <laughs> no, 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 no jargon, no jargon. Yep. Uh, and, and formulas you want to uh, make as applicable to their everyday lives as possible. So for example, we all get these mysterious things called power bills and they have these funny units called kilowatt hours on it. And what the heck is a mm -hmm. kilowatt hour? So, um, uh, you know, getting them to be able to understand uh, the relationship between power, energy, and time uh, is something we do a fair bit about. We also don't do, um, I've learned over time not to do exact problems, right? Where you're going to solve something and write something down to two significant figures or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so we focus really on order of magnitude estimates, right? So factors of 10 are perfectly fine. Um, and that's how I get to them uh, with a level of math that they can handle. Uh, but mm -hmm not just the the understanding I'm really after the physical understanding of how things work and things go so those were my big lessons from the art institute oh that's 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 cool because we we take the 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 a in steam pretty seriously here although so a lot of times we we drop it off if the audience isn't going to get it but you know the astrophysics and steam is about science technology engineering arts and mathematics, and a... we really emphasize with our students that we um, that come here that it the graphic and design abilities that you come with and you bring to um, the way to visualize or to create spaces or to create um, other things out of data is really important. And we use a lot of design people's um, expertise in, in social media, in creating curricula. Um, we need all those skills. So, and we need people who understand the science who also can manage, you know, everything from an exacto knife to 3D modeling on a, on a, with a printer. Um, all of those are important. Absolutely. So one of the things I do do in my courses, and I've done it every year now for quite a while, is I have them do a final design project. Mm -hmm. Any they want, any medium they want, um, as long as it sort of hits the, the course objectives. Um, and uh, it lets people express their artistic side so that A, in STEAM, on whatever modality or mechanism they might want to do. And, and it's, it's amazing how much time they and energy they will put into those final projects where they get to express themselves uh, relative to the point value of the project. So. Um, it's 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 a good thing to have them express. It's good. Yeah, we're learning more and more about you know the increasing the number of modalities that you're using to teach a concept. It increases everybody's ability to um, to engage and to retain 
uh, that content and um, it, it's more equitable and accessible to everybody. Yeah, and I just want to remark, it was a two-way street when I was at the Art Institute. So I taught them science and they taught me a little bit of art. <laughs> um, and it's where I actually picked up my graphic design skills. That's where I first started learning Adobe Illustrator. Um, mm -hmm. back then. So these days I'm, I'm, I'm not any good at it, but um, I'm better than I was, let's put it that way. <laughs> so very cool. Very cool. Um, so what are the... So what do are, you oh, go ahead. see some toys? I want to see some toys. Let's do a toy. All right. So, so a lot of the work we um, are doing, uh, we did at Glass. We started at Yerkes uh, many years ago because we're so close to the Wisconsin School for the Blind and the Wisconsin School for the Deaf. And my predecessor, Vivian Hetty, was really into making sure the observatory itself was accessible to everybody and the program. So one grant after another was working on building up those, those resources. So back in the day, and it was back in the day, the 2000s, we were just doing, we thought, you know, tactile graphics were really great. Ooh, and ooh. just invitation, inviting people to be part of the life of the observatory. We've yeah. gotten increasingly more sophisticated over the years. And, uh, and we, before leaving um, the observatory, we had uh, started a National Science Foundation grant called Innovators Developing Accessible Tools for Astronomy cool. that engaged blind and visually impaired students, teachers, yeah. astronomers, and fully sighted everybody in those professions um, together to uh, see if we can work on making uh, some online software called Afterglow developed by UNC Tra Chapel Hill, more accessible to everybody. And we learned a lot about what to do and what not to do <laughs> when you're designing uh, curricula, hands-on materials, um, but we came out with some really cool things. So we're going to start with some of my favorites from that project. Awesome. And we have the, um, and some of these things, one of our challenges, even going forward to today, is, um, is finding ways to bring those products, the things that we created to some sort of market. So yeah. we continue to work on that challenge. And this is, this one is a particular challenge. It's our um, tactile um, umbrella, those of us who are old enough to have gone to a bus stop in the 70s, remember how cool we were standing there if you <laughs> had a bubble are. umbrella. And these today, these are great for stitching in the lines of Ari and Duck. Oh, and yeah. the, you have the ecliptic, you have the celestial oh, equator, oh. Um, yeah. and it divides up really nicely into um, for, for the Ari and Duck, and the tabs are in large print and braille. And then you can use all sorts of tactile devices from brads to um, there's all sorts of sticky things. Um, the craft stores are a great place to go shopping for doing this. Once you have this stitched in, you can um, develop a series of these that we use at star parties that demonstrate concepts. So what we also have learned through iData was one concept at a time. Don't get tactily, you know, confusing because it can be just like noise. Um, just because you, you know, don't put too much on one product right. and, and these are really great for demonstrating, you know, the, how the, how the, you know, sky moves and, um, and what you're going to see and where, what does it mean to be circumpolar and what are you seeing in the South? So there's all sorts of just basic astronomy things that you can do with this and it works with everybody. I did it at camp this summer with uh, 24 girls and we had 12 umbrellas out there and it, you know, kind of looks like a dance after a while. Yeah, and it, so, so so these, this is one of my, the fun ones and we have instructions for these and at by fall, we will have a website up where you can grab all of these um, instruction. But this came, this is one of the things that came out of iData. You don't have to get fancy, but you can. And if you do, it's really fun. It's really fun. And pretty durable too. This has been to many star parties. So Very, that's that one. So that's a uh, uh, do it yourself. Have you ever, uh, I'm putting together, have you uh, ever considered um, uh, having it made externally and then, yes. and then and, built for sale? Yes. And this is one of the things that we're finding really challenging. So when we're doing product development and we want to stay in the U.S. if we can, we also want to work through industries for the blind or visually impaired if we can, and then just finding, not having just the, we don't have the staffing to figure out some of those pathways. So I've 
had no luck with this particular product. So we'd have to get the skin of the umbrella, figure out who's going to stitch it, who's going to assemble it. And then, then the whole marketing side of it. Um, I think I just would start by showing up at a double AS meeting because of by the rate at which cool jewelry goes out of that, those conferences, I think we could do well. I was going to say startorialist just to give them a plug here, um, have a lot of very cool stuff and they have all kinds of in, you know, inroads into these, uh, you know, manufacturing lines. Uh, well, stuff. So they might, I'm just throwing that out, not to commit them or anything. I'm just mentioning it, but something like startorialist might be an interesting venue for that. Yeah, and that's an area that we definitely could use some help on. Thanks to, and that's another. So one of our our areas that we're um, we have made a few, little bit of progress on, and we have a patent pending on this guy. And mm-hmm. this is this came out of IDATA as well as a side project by one of our interns. We one of the things that we do here is we have uh, like students involved from high school through post graduate, they come back, they keep contributing. Um, and IDATA students, um, undergraduate mentors were part of this project. And this was one of their ideas that we continue to develop. But this is a force keyboard that translates, you know, magnitude is just terrible to explain to anybody. But a point <laughs> source in the it's sky that, change, that changes brightness to someone who's blind is nonsensical. Mm-hmm. So we changed it into force. Cool. And on a we have one of these as a logarithmic scale and one as a linear scale so you can compare. And we're working on a design so that you can take the springs in and out and make different patterns with them. We tested this with focus groups and it does work. Cool. So kind of fun. Yeah, that's a nice tactile tactile way to get dim and bright going on a log screen. Yeah, so we're working on that one's made our most progress in terms of looking at how to um, manufacture those. But on, on terms of product development and design stuff, the one that we have that's that came out of actually a double AS meeting, I used to do work for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey out, okay. Education Outreach. Uh-huh. And I always loved their, their beautiful picture. And they had this deck of cards one year. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if that deck of cards was accessible? Well, that was at least five or six years ago. And a number of interns later, oh, we have uh-huh. the we have the galaxy cards and the galaxy cards have uh, the Sloan um, image in the middle. And so we have a number, let me see if I can find you. We have 52 of these cards that are 3d printed. And so your, your galaxy is in the middle and you have the color, which we've interpreted as, um, as a number brightness on a scale with the color of this object as a dot on a scale. And then characteristics, some physical characteristic, and then the shape of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And the number of this galaxy is on the card in print and braille. And it ties back directly back to the Sloan data. So so you can use these at whatever level you want, high school, uh, college level. But when you play games with them, and we have played games with them, you can play dominoes, you can play go fish. There's come some cool things you can do. And when you look for patterns, then when you're done, ah. you can look for the pattern of the um, the spectra on the back. Very cool. So well, this this project is hands down my current favorite. Okay. And th- are those available to educators? Those, the STL files are available. Um, okay. There's 52 of them. And it's a like a seven hour print per card. So we've got, and we're also looking at through um, support again through Angel Family Foundation, uh, mm-hmm. looking at creating molds for these and seeing if we can find a, a less expensive manufacturing pathway for these cards. But um, that's gonna take a little bit more work it, until then. By fall, we'll have these files up online for people to access. And, um, and we'll hopefully start testing if they teach what we think they're going to teach. So mm-hmm. that would be another piece of that whole educational research that we'd really like to stay involved with. So we, we're not just an arts and crafts place here. We do serious Jeez. educational research. Oh, and <laughs> so we don't, we don't just, we have fun with that too. So. Very um, good. Very good. So we're gonna we're gonna put a link below the video here uh, to to the uh, Geneva uh, Lake Astrophysics and Steam website, and we'll maybe we'll sneak in a few links to some of these um, to some of these toys to some of these um, ideas. So very good. So and some of the things that we do that I really love about 
working here is that it's a really collaborative effort. So those cards have supported um, five or six different interns, uh, three of whom have, have had vision impairments to participate in the development of these projects, put, make something for their resumes. We take, we go to conferences, we write papers, we write blog posts. So it's about, everything that we do is about creating things, but creating things in a way that is uh, kind of developing the, the career skills of the people who um, are gonna go out into the community and, and also unleashing good researchers who have excellent uh, ability to create accessible materials as well for their, for whatever venue that their, their whatever their topic is. So how many, how many people, how many people, or how many staff, or however you want to count it, um, enumerated? How many people are associated with Geneva Lake Astrophysics and Steam? We have three full-time staff, yeah. uh, three part-time staff, and this summer we had three additional temp temporary full-time, um, and uh, seven interns. Oh, okay. So, okay. so we get, um, yeah, that's our. And we have um, a number of high school students. We have about sixty-five volunteers on our on our call list okay. now. Haven't yeah. tapped that fully since COVID, but but the sixty-five are still there. Very good, very good. And how so, many roughly yeah. how many students uh, per year? Let's say whatever time frame. You well, want we probably to we've much. we've given internships to the the ones who are here regularly. So we have only about. 20 active students and three of those have gotten internships with us to keep them um, engaged. Uh, one of them is working on a sonification project with us. So that's another area that we're, cool. we are really big into is yeah. I somehow became the grand secretary of data sonification because when we work on iData, I just noticed that there's so many cool sonification projects out there that weren't talking to each other. Okay. So I thought, well, just have a meeting. We'll do a Zoom meeting because it's COVID, right? What else are we going to do? Awesome. And so we had Sonification World Chat was born and, and it continued. And so now it has grown into a number of efforts, you know, worldwide that are, are working on, on connecting projects um, in Sonification. So that's another thing that we do here. So you, you, so you intoned earlier that you run projects, summer projects where you'll get a bunch of students together. Um, and so... Uh, how many of those students do you touch in a given year, let's say? About six or seven. Cool. So each summer, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah, we've done some things through Space Grant. Uh, we use, still do a lot of stuff with the SDSS data and resources, making, doing more things with the, those data because I'm really familiar with those. And um, and just on local projects, we create sensors. Uh, students are building dark sky sensors to, um, to uh, that can be remotely operated and accessed. So there's a handheld units that you can take out and measure the sky, but they're nice. $300 a piece. Mm -hmm. So we've been trying to make a less expensive one that students build, have designed and engineered and tested and redesigned and re-engineered. Right now, the shortage of Raspberry Pis worldwide are holding up all of the progress, but um, yep. but that those are some of the things that we have students working on those throughout the year. Very cool, very cool. Can I ask a dangerous question? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so, what is the business model for uh, Geneva Lake Astrophysics and Steam? Is it is it oh my god? Advance? Is it uh, you know Kickstarter campaigns? Do you have you know tons of product that you move out the door? A combination of the above? Um, just curious. Okay, so I'm going to give myself two minutes to whine and complain. Okay. No, <laughs> our business model leaving your keys was keep it alive for a year. Sure. And so we started off with this model where we have these great programs. So we'd say, well, these are our great programs. Do you want to fund them? And that's not the greatest business model. So we're trying to dig ourselves out of having a great idea, working really hard to prove that it's cool and then get somebody funded to working to something a little bit more sustainable. And right now we're just getting to the point where we're, um, we are not going to be returning to your keys. So we have ha we're really having to switch and post COVID. So it was, you know, every, we've had to reinvent ourselves a number of times. So our latest version of that is trying to stabilize um, to small donors. 
Uh, we've had lot, we've really survived on a few handful of really large donors yeah. uh, who have sustained us. Leaving the observatory was two individuals really that that allowed us uh, the staff of two at the time to to keep this going. And then um, we've been holding. We we're getting into the whole fundraiser nonprofit. Um, Mm -hmm. And we're looking at possible, what can we do with products or patents? We're kind of of different directions to see what yeah. will stick. We haven't had much luck with GoFundMe or Kickstarter campaigns. Um, that might just be ignorance or, um, but we, but we do have much better luck with foundations and individual donors. Mm -hmm. Patreon. Yeah. I mean, if Patreon. I could get. Is a model. Did, do they, yeah. The Patreon model, I, if, uh, do they, yeah, I'd have to look into what exactly, but. I uh, lost you there for a second, but that's okay. Um, yeah, so the Patreon model is is uh, uh, you're basically creating patrons who will um, who will support your project, whatever it is, and people have all kinds of projects, whether it's music or art or science mm -hmm. or education, um, and then they will get, you know, exclusive, you know, early access to materials you're putting out, or they just believe in what you do. Um, so it, it's, uh, you know, it's as the name says, patron, you're going to build a, a patron community. And they, they contribute at some level, uh, either a mm -hmm. one time or more preferably at a, at a constant rate. So they may do $20 a month or whatever it may be. Um, and you set various uh, levels on your, on your Patreon account and stuff. So anyway, I'm just throwing that out there. Check it out. Well, I've always thought of them as the podcast mm -hmm. people and thought of that as an avenue for regular nonprofit people. Yeah. People put an amazing number of things on, on Patreon. Um, mm -hmm. not, not everyone is successful there because you mm -hmm. do have to build your base and, you know, work to get your patrons and keep your patrons and all that, but it is a, a way of, uh, you know, directly getting, rather than just putting something out, let's say on YouTube, for example, yeah. um, or something like that, where YouTube makes all the money. Um, yeah. So it's a way of trying to get to the artists, to the creative types directly. Um, that's, yeah. that's really interesting because we have started, we've gotten to the point where we have a, um, a newsletter and one of our longtime um, people who've been with us since Yerkes, since she was at summer camp has, has been consulting on some projects and she, her background really now is in fundraising media marketing and he said you know i'm yeah. just going to help you through the fall because you really need this so uh -huh. she's i'm hoping she's going to kick us in the right direction um and uh just stay tuned we may we may become oh. trendy by november i look forward to being trendy with you. <laughs> that's awesome got any more well in the uh, it, well in the the area of, of cool said that um the galaxy card um we one of our one of our students said you know you should <clears throat> you should enter the Prusa contest. So we won the Prusa 3D printer contest because we have a farm of Prusa 3D printers in the back, which we are uh, attempting uh, to make accessible to so yeah. the blind and visually impaired people who have been displaced by COVID or have just low incomes can, uh, it's kind of my heifer model of uh, 3D printers. You get a 3D printer, you print our stuff at cost, and then you can use the printer for your own home business. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working on that as a project and we won so we're hoping to get a little press off of that so there's there's our gold signed um that was our prize right back there gold 3d printer and um yeah so and if we print a lot of really cool things so we showed them how we create um okay. we've created puzzle pieces with the electromagnetic spectrum so you kind of click all these guys together and oh. so those are tactile and uh we've got uh lacing cards for doing electric spectrum stuff 3d printed and you get those oh, and you nice. can hook so when you have students i was really shocked this summer students don't know how to use lacing cards anymore it's like dang i'm really getting old so <laughs> that was fun i think it was a, that was good for them that was good for their hand-eye coordination to learn how to yeah. do this so mm -hmm. making waveforms on a lacing card was pretty fun mm -hmm. and we so we showed them some of the cool things that we're doing and um yeah, there's there's just a ton of stuff um, on the, yeah, just a ton of stuff in here. We try for teaching the sequence of um, how you know you come from a star and the light travels and it's like we want to teach that whole sequence of electromagnetic waves traveling to Earth, hitting the CCD camera, 
All of that, we want to be able to do that in the most accessible multimodal way that we can. Mm -hmm. And so our whole series, we have just a whole series of things teaching everything from those waves, particles, how a CCD camera works in um, in a tactile, uh, we have a, a mm. human demo for uh, CCD yeah. cameras, mm. and then and then how data manipulation is done with you know just simple the crafty things. It's just an L mm. on a just a three D printed L on a card that you can touch and understand what it means when data is flipped or turned. What mm. what kind of data manipulation and that that data is coming to you on a grid yes and that each one of these grids it has a number and you're flipping the grid and then you tie that to the computing science part of that where it's actually in a matrix and then this stuff starts to make a little bit more sense when you're coming through a sequence of of activity so there's there's quite a bit of, of things that we're doing and if you know as we go along for example with those puzzle pieces we know that if you're doing puzzle pieces, you're also building in misconceptions at the same time. So we try and take a look at what are those misconceptions like? If you have all those puzzle pieces the same size, then how do you communicate that the visible part of the spectrum is a lot smaller than the radio part of the spectrum, uh -huh. which oh. <laughs> is really, really takes up a lot of space. It so, does. So we try to think about what, you know, in tactile, you know, ways that people can really get their hands on it and mess around with it. Very and nice. Very nice. What, what so, you know, try to think about all of the ways that people are going to interact with this information. So we have the sequence so that um, we're not just doing isolated and, and hang out by themselves. Right. right. As, I, I can as, see some interesting possibilities with that, with uh, uh, if you move into multi messenger stuff, for example, like gravitational waves, um, you know, colliding things or whatever things make <clears throat> gravitational waves. Uh oh, uh oh, I triggered something. She's got something. <laughs> I, um, I do. <clears throat> yes. In fact, we're working with um, Dan Reichert and that whole team out of UNC Chapel Hill to mm -hmm. work on accessibilizing their new curriculum, a multi wavelength universe. Yeah, and right. one of the things we're looking at is how do you explain filters to someone who cannot see? Okay. Can't see a filter, first of all, okay. you're going to need to be able to touch those filters. Mm -hmm. So these are the Sloan Digital Sky Survey filters. We also have Johnson and Cousins. Oh, very and, good. Yeah, yeah. and those are the bands, but they also connect with, so here are also the spectral profiles of all the, 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 the stars. Nice. So if you want, and then we'll have, we have galaxies as well. And then if you want to, you can just start matching up in one of these. So what am I actually imaging? What is the camera capturing when I put these two together? You oh. take a filter, you put a filter together with a spectral profile and you can give some an example of what is really happening. What does it mean to have a filter Why? capture a particular piece of light? And then I'm not done yet. There's more. Oh, good. Thanks to... Thanks to her amazing um, intern turned um, summer staff, we've got and gone to um, for each filter. What does the different? And here we have Stevens Quintet. Uh -huh. How do each one of the filters? We, for each filter, we've taken uh -huh. a different uh -huh. image set, so you can feel. So you've got yeah. what does it mean yeah, yeah. for the filters? What does it mean for the the image data? How right. does that translate into a tactile graphic? Right. And and that, I hope, will complete the picture. Yet to be tested, but that's what we've got going. That's right. our latest and greatest. All right. People, you should check out those latest and greatest. Let's see if we can bring in more people, more diversity. Very good. Very cool. All right. Awesome. Kate. So, and for every... Every set of every piece of the electromagnetic spectrum, you got to be able to talk about where, um, how it's, uh, what kind of instrument image is it? So for each uh, each portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, we've made sure that we've created or taken, we've just taken models that are online, but we make sure they move. Uh -huh. So we want to make sure every every telescope okay. that we're we're having 
that is specializes in a particular piece of the electromagnetic spectrum, that that telescope is represented, that someone can touch that telescope and understand what the shape and how it moves. So um, space telescopes make it easy on us, but that one, these guys take a little bit of adjusting and yeah. I think all telescopes should be point, painted that color. I think it's just yeah, the, uh, yeah the filament, that's one of my favorite filament colors. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Kate, thank you so much for sharing your activities and all the um, resources that you're putting up online uh, for for people, um, uh, for educators across the globe, actually. So I think that's that's wonderful. I think that's great. Well, we look forward to this fall really making headway on getting our resource repository um, something that it doesn't require me to hit the send button. So mm -hmm. we're going to we're going to work on that. And because all of these products have come out of National Science Foundation uh, originally or from supported projects, at this point they are free. Um, we want to make things as easy on educators as we can, and we know that printing the 3D printing things isn't going to be free. So, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. Um, I had so much fun showing off our our stuff today, well, and um, you can stop by anytime you want to make a trip to Wisconsin. I will. I will. That'd be very cool. So let me ask. Uh, so we've kind of got a sense of of where you're at, where where uh, Geneva Lake Astrophysics and Steam is right now. Uh, you know, always a little dangerous to do projection, but you know, the bright future is always fun. Um, so where where do you think this goes? Let's say over the next, let's say two to five years, or where would you like it to be in two to five years? Uh, where I'd like it to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would like us to have, um, because right now we've managed to get to the point where we are employing um, be people with um, visual impairments at the office mm -hmm. on enough of a full uh, basis to actually have them have a career out of being with us. Nice. And I'd like to see the same happen um, in the area of mobility disabilities and with deaf and hard of hearing. Mm -hmm. And that's going to take us a lot of dollars and um, a lot of more community building. Our work with the deaf and hard of hearing community was hit really hard during COVID because it's just really hard to get people masking. And even with those clear masks, it's very difficult to, to work with um, people from the, uh, from the uh, DHH community. Right. So, um, so that, my, my hope would be we'd have full-time dark skies going here. We would have, um, uh, people working with us full time that represent the communities that we want to work with. We would we already have um, the fluent Spanish speakers with us. Um, I'd like to expand from that. I'd like to be a develop better relationships or more any relationship with um, the indigenous groups in in Wisconsin and in the Midwest. Uh, I'd like to see a fully funded our our regional office of astronomy for development with IAU is not funded fully right now. Yeah. That funding would allow us to do a lot more outreach um, to um, underrepresented groups, everybody from, um, you know, uh, different language groups, people in working in astrotourism, um, incarceration. I mean, just a lot of ways to use astronomy for yeah. economic and social development. Um, we lit, our, our building is situated at a, um, as re we rent space from a, Inspiration Ministries, which runs um, assisted living for people with imp um, with cognitive impairments primarily. Okay. I would love to see us engage more with them and rent um, actual rent housing from them so that people with disabilities could work here and not we wouldn't have to work. Oh, nice. They would be independent, not have transportation issues. So I see a lot of vision in that area and having this be a dynamic place where people come to learn and people call us when they have a problem. I really believe that teachers and educators shouldn't have to invent all this stuff on their own. They should, help, and we should be there and it shouldn't cost them a million bucks to do it. No. There, that's my vision. Good, awesome vision. And I wish you the best of luck in reaching that vision and I'm happy to help reach help you reach that. That's one of the reasons why we're doing this video is to get the word out uh, so you can um, create that, uh, that future that you want. So it's really awesome. So Kate, thank you so much. Thank you. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy and your astronomy education day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.